How'd you do that? I'm the Batman. These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. Hey there, it's me, your least favorite YouTuber, Vean Fuso. And today, I'm here to talk about what I think is one of the most underrated Batman shows of all time. A show I don't hear get brought up all that often nowadays. A show by the name of... This often forgotten or little known animated series ran on the WB back in 2004. What's interesting is that the show wasn't a one and done. The show didn't try and fail, it was actually quite successful. As a matter of fact, it ran for five seasons. And it even had its own spin-off movie and a spin-off comic series. I think a big part of the reason the show isn't as talked about as it should be is probably for the same reason you don't hear a lot about other Batman animated shows. Because all of them are overshadowed by their predecessor, Batman the Animated Series. But realistically, how could any Batman series live up to what many considered the holy grail of Batman? All Batman things good, and even great, usually pale in comparison to the animated series. And being as this was the first animated Batman show to come after that legendary series was cancelled, of course it's gonna get compared to it. But I think if you look outside that comparison and try to approach this series as its own thing, there's actually a whole lot to like. Firstly, the animation is great. And why wouldn't it be? It was animated by the same people who put together Jackie Chan Adventures. Which also may be why this Joker reminds me of the Monkey King. The characters' designs, I'll admit, are either hit or miss. Characters like Man Bat and Killer Croc look great. But then you have Hugo Strange and Mr. Freeze who... I don't know, I'm just... I'm just not so hot on. No pun intended. I really like that the series tried new things, but they didn't always work out. Like, oh cool, I guess the Riddler had a Marilyn Manson face. That's relatable. I think the worst of the worst though here has to be Bane, who despite being a cartoon character on a cartoon show that is decidedly... uh... cartoony? He still looks completely out of place. Speaking of out of place, Dracula. Vampires. In Batman. Okay. Yeah, bizarre choice. These are two things I love, but still two things I don't necessarily want to put together. Like bacon, egg, and cheeses and my dog Chubby. I love them both, but I don't necessarily wanna I don't necessarily wanna put them together. It just doesn't sound appetizing to me. Anyway, despite feeling out of place, look-wise, he fits right in. Definitely not the worst Dracula I've seen put to screen. <coughs> Buffy! Characters like Harley Quinn, the Penguin, Poison Ivy, Firefly, and Black Mask all look pretty serviceable. I mean, they're alright. Uh, nothing to hate, but, you know, not exactly anything to love either. But personally, I think the highlights of this series, both in terms of look and character, are Clayface and the Joker. Now, before Jared Leto decided to don his signature grills, this version of the Joker was probably the most divisive. It certainly wasn't the Joker that many people came to know and love. I mean, here was this homeless looking loon who didn't own or just didn't care to wear shoes. And he also didn't always wear his signature purple suit. Some of the time, he wore a multicolored straight jacket. And I love it. This is actually both one of my favorite designs and favorite performances of the Joker character. Yeah, it's a different take on the Clown Prince of Crime, but at least this one was actually a clown. And wasn't just played by one. I think the show is true to a lot of what made the character work. They colored in the lines that they were given, but they also added more to the picture. This iteration of the Joker was the perfect amalgamation of being goofy, but also being unreasonably threatening. The guy was the Kurt Angle of his time. yippee ki -yay. And because the performance could work in a comedic or a more sinister setting, the Joker was depicted as a joke in some episodes and a serious problem in others. And never once did any of it feel out of character or, you know, mismanaged. The Penguin didn't exactly get the same respect, as he was only showcased as a real opponent for Bats in the first and second season of the show, but was then a punchline thereafter for the remainder of the series. But this isn't about him right now, so back to the Joker. I really gotta give Kevin and Michael Richardson his roses here. Because he put the work into this role, and he gave a different take on the character 
when everyone else just wanted to try and emulate and impersonate Mark Hamill. To varying degrees of success. My card! We'll do lunch. But here, he actually gave us an entirely different take. Speaking of a different take, the show's interpretation of Clayface is some of the most compelling storytelling I've ever seen with the character. And I'm a guy who likes Clayface, as you'll see in future videos on this channel. Instead of using Matt Hagen, who is the go-to Clayface of the bunch, or any of the dozens of other Clayfaces there are out there, no, seriously, there's a lot. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch of them. Instead of using an already created and established Clayface, this series decided to make their own. The character was introduced in the first episode of the first season of the show, shown to be Bruce's childhood friend, Detective Ethan Bennett. The character was likable enough on his own, and the fact that the GCPD were constantly trying to take down the Batman, all while one of them unknowingly was buddy-buddy with him, made for a really interesting contrast. At the end of the same season where he's introduced as a hero, he's turned into a villain. Through one of Joker's many nefarious schemes, he turns Gotham City's finest into one of Gotham City's worst, using what is known as Joker Putty and transforming him into Clayface. The follow-up episodes were really great, and this was some really heavy material and heartbreaking stuff for a show that was decidedly more family-friendly than the Batman series that came before. And the character had an in-depth, interesting arc that saw a well-deserved redemption at the end. The Clayface episodes of this show are probably my favorite. They're easy to get invested in, and I think that this is the most serious the show ever took the material. But now that I'm looking back at the show as an adult, I think in a lot of ways the Ethan character was the show's surrogate Harvey Dent. I mean, just think about it. Best friends with Bruce? Check. Has a job in law enforcement? Check. Villainy brought on by tragedy? Check. Bad guy name having the word face at the end of it? Check. Ding, ding, ding! We got a winner. The show did this a lot. It may not have always been entirely faithful to the source material, but it did always remain within the realm of truth. For example, Harley Quinn, who's normally a psychologist at Arkham Asylum, who was driven mad by the Joker, is now made a TV show host of a psychology-driven show. Then she gets fired, and the Joker takes advantage of her. So again, it's not panel for panel the story that you knew, but there are enough elements from it that it feels true to that story, just now with its own creative twist on things. One of the things I find really interesting about the series is that not every villain makes the cut. Missing from Batman's typical villains lineup are Scarecrow, Ra's al Ghul, Two-Face, and the Mad Hatter. And yeah, I understand that not every villain is gonna show up. God knows that Batman has way too many of them to begin with, un unless you wanted this series to continue on for as long as we're allowing Grant Morrison to write. There's just no way that every character from the comics is gonna make their way over to a TV show. But these are some pretty notable names missing. Now granted, Two-Face also didn't show up in the 1960s show, and Ray Jal Ghul hasn't made it to every Batman video game, and the Mad Hatter has never been in a Batman movie, but it's still weird to think that these characters didn't make it to this show, yet somehow the Clue Master did. I can't even be angry, the show gave us the only interpretation of Clue Master that was out outside of a comic book back in the day. And yeah, he's changed significantly, but, you know, take what you can get. And this show clearly took some risks. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the voice cast for the series is just, it's just really some top-notch shit. There are a bunch of fan service roles that saw established actors famous for appearing in other Batman or DC media take on characters in this franchise. For example, Adam West, whose career was defined by playing Batman in the 1960s, joined the cast as Mayor Marion Grange. And this was far from a walk-on screen and wink cameo. He actually returned to the role several times throughout the series. Likewise, Frank Gorshin, who played the Riddler on that very same Batman series, also here portrays Arkham's head honcho, Dr. Hugo Strange. Mark Hamill, who played the Joker in Batman the Animated Series, and many, many, many things after that, plays Tony Zuko the guy who plays a pretty big role in Robin's origin story. 
Kevin Conroy, who also made a career off playing Batman, plays the father of Dick Grayson. Will Friedell, who played Batman Beyond, plays Gearhead. Jeffrey Combs, who played my favorite version of the Scarecrow, plays some nobody. Ron Perlman, who was once Clayface, is now Killer Croc. Phil Lamar, who portrayed Static Shock in Green Lantern in the DCAU, plays the villain Maximilian Zeus. And Hinden Walsh, who played Starfire on the Teen Titans, now plays Harley Quinn. Ian Abercrombie, who played Alfred in Birds of Prey, has a bit role here as well. And Allison Mack, who played Chloe on Smallville, even plays... Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe, maybe let's skip that one. Maybe let's just not go there. George Newbern, who portrayed Superman in the Justice League animated series, surprisingly comes back to reprise the role here, as does Clancy Brown as Lex Luthor. Now, I know this sounds like a lot, and it is, but I could actually go on. There's a lot of returning talent here. In terms of the cast outside of those returning to DC, it's pretty impressive. The T-1000 plays Hawkman, Freddy Krueger is cast as the Riddler, Black Mask is played by Ajax, Homer Simpson was the ventriloquist, Spongebob actually makes a pretty good penguin, and Dermot Moroney is the Green Lantern. I I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't really remember the names of any characters he's played in, I just, I just know him. And actually, come to think of it, I'm not even sure where I know him from or why. But I do. Other familiar names such as Brandon Ralph, Brooke Shields, and apparently Chris Pratt also play minor roles in the series. Again, I could go on, but I won't. I realize I spoke about the Joker performance in the show, and I mentioned how different it was from a lot of the other Joker performances that you might have heard, but I'm just now realizing that the same could be said for Batman. Here, Batman is a little less gruff, and his voice is probably not as deep as you would have imagined. But that might be because this is Batman in his early years. The show is set in his third year as Batman, which would make Bruce about 26 years old here at the time. Which is a little bit different from how we normally see him. Usually Batman stories have a veteran Batman at the helm. We're typically seeing a man in his mid-30s to mid-40s crouching down on a gargoyle on an abandoned rooftop somewhere in Gotham City, most likely brooding and flashing back to the night that his innocence was taken and his parents were murdered. But I really like the idea of seeing a younger version of Bruce, for a couple of reasons. For starters, I think it's interesting to see where he started off and how he evolved into the legend that he's known to be. Also, I think at some point in time, Batman just becomes OP'd. You know? Way too overpowered. Like, yeah, you guys write him and say that he's just a human being, but having him being a human being of immense intelligence, ridiculous endurance, a bank account with endless zeros, an unlimited number of gadgets, an extended knowledge of multiple fighting styles, and superior detective skills to any cop in the city, I mean, at, at some point he just might as well be Superman. I feel that a younger, less experienced Bruce makes his villains much more of a threat to him. And that makes for much more interesting back and forths. And stories that's a little bit easier to get invested in. I also like that the show started off three years into his run as Batman. So he's not entirely inexperienced. We're not going to see him shoot the grappling gun for the first time or, you know, possibly piss his pants in his first encounter. Thanks for that, Kevin. You know, the guy's a little green. I mean, he's still learning, but he's done enough along the way to have some idea of what it is he's supposed to be doing. While the series originated with Batman as a loner, by the end of the show's run, it shows the beginnings of the Bat Family and his introduction and inclusion in the Justice League. The show made some interesting decisions as well, such as bringing in Batgirl before they ever introduced Robin. Though, to be fair, this had a lot to do with the fact that, for one reason or another, Warner Brothers felt, and in some cases to this day, still feel, that having multiple versions of the same character in different movies, TV shows, and other media gets confusing for viewers. That was the mentality they had at the time. Warner Brothers felt including Robin on the Batman would confuse people who watched Teen Titans, because that show was out at the time. Now let's compare that logic to today, where we just had Ben Affleck reprise his role as Batman in the Snyder Cut earlier this year, we have Robert Pattinson playing Batman for the first time in a brand new movie slated for next year, and later that same year, we have both Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton reprising their roles as Batman 
insane movie. Times, they are changing. Anyway, being that Robin already had a presence in the Teen Titans show, he had to be held back until that show was cancelled. And what's especially sad is that despite being introduced and utilized first, Batgirl kind of gets pushed to the background and becomes a supporting character when Robin shows up. I mean, granted, that's kind of what she was originally in both the 1960s show and also the animated series, but she also wasn't introduced first, shown to be a full-time sidekick, and then all of a sudden, you know, then began to make sporadic appearances. All in all, I think they did a really good job of recreating the classic origin stories of Batman sidekicks. Once again, albeit with a little bit of changes here and there. Such as aging down Poison Ivy to make her Batgirl's high school BFF. I think a big thing the series got right, I mean, there, there were a lot of things, but one of them that really sticks out to me now, is its fight scenes. They're really well choreographed. I mean, not that animation cells could be choreographed. You know, whatever the right word is here, feel free to insert it yourself. You know what I'm saying. And not just the fight scenes, but the action scenes in general. And I'll even say a lot of the time, I think that they're better than Batman the Animated Series. I know. I know. Blasphemy. The show has a fair balance to it. It's not as serious as Batman the Animated Series, but it's also not as campy and goofy as the 1960s show. I mean, it takes itself seriously, but not too seriously. The show can have fun and joke around when it's the right time with the right character, and while it can get very cartoony at times, it also remains somewhat grounded. If I'm being honest, no. I don't think any of the characters that were on the show come across as definitive versions of those characters, but they do definitely come across as those characters. Which is something I can't say for every interpretation of Batman. For a bunch of fictional beings who are so ingrained in comic book culture, you'd be surprised how easy they are to screw up. And in my opinion, this show didn't screw them up. Those who put this together understood Batman, and more importantly, understood the world of Batman. It's sad that the show doesn't get brought up more, or hasn't been given the right amount of attention, but hopefully we can help remedy that today. If you've yet to see the Batman, I'm not just recommending, I'm insisting that you do. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see me talk more in depth about said series, then end your comment with... Batman. With that being said, I was your least favorite YouTuber, V Infuso, and I hope to see you in the next one. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.